So is it 915 yet? Close enough. Yeah, GPS time. Let's sync our boxes. Snap. So just to confirm, this is the advanced session, so if you're looking for a certification, please exit stage right. We're going to mix it up a little bit today, um, since a lot of you guys have experience. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, um, kind of regardless of how you time or um, what systems that you time, we're going to try to help facilitate some discussions on best practices. We understand that some people in the room might be competitors and things like that, but you know, hopefully, um, I think I think there's some kind of interesting information to share because um, I pretty I talk to most of the people in the room either directly or indirectly, and I have some pretty you know, good consensus on like well, how people are feeling about the market and like where they see things going. And I think we can kind of together um, discuss some concepts and ideas on how to, uh, you know, you know, look at 2020 because um, right now is kind of a downtime for most of you guys. So you might be doing a little break now, but then, you know, you're going to do a lot of planning for the winter time and for you know, today we're going to be going over a lot of information. This is kind of the general schedule here. The one thing that I wanted to mention to you guys is that we do have a demo room. So if you get to a point where you feel like a particular session isn't necessary for you, we've got the demo room. So the demo room, for a lot of you guys, it's gonna be the checking up. And we get a ton of questions about it. It's, it's primarily just like, I'm not comfortable with it. Can you help me be comfortable with it? So we actually have equipment set up. The only thing I would clarify on, if you're gonna do training on the checking app, you need to be specific about what equipment that you're gonna use, um, meaning, I'm gonna, I wanna use my phone, I wanna use a tablet, I wanna use my, my laptops. Um, because the, how they're gonna show it to you is slightly different. Um, so you're gonna waste your time if you're gonna get trained on one, like on the app, and then you're gonna use a laptop. Like that's just not a good use of your time. One of the things that we wanted to make sure that you guys understood is that number one, we have piled 20 pounds worth of stuff in a 10 pound sack in the past day. We understand that. If we could do this, you know, more spread out, like I think that'd be better for all of us. Um, but the most important thing to take away is that um, we've actually added headcount to the race day team. Um, some of them is the, uh, uh, the we've actually added some interns. Um, so our intern program is kind of a fear program for developers. I was just talking to one of our developers that's an intern. He's actually super excited about the project. He likes the code base and, you know, kind of wants to, you know, potentially join the team, which is great for us because, you know, you guys have a lot of requests. Um, and all that stuff takes developers. Um, and believe it or not, developers do not grow on trees. So the, the suite that we have now, the only one that I feel like we probably, I mean, all of them need to get improved in some shape or fashion, but the one that I feel like we, we've got the biggest jump in the future on is gonna be photos. Our long-term strategy for photos is, you'll have to use race day scoring to run the chip reads through, but we wanna kind of sync on the read of the chip and a timestamp of the photo and try to sync those together. That's that's like, to me, our biggest hole in the offering that I'd like to kind of bring together in the future. Kind of where we see ourselves differentiating ourselves with the race day suite is, the way I, I kind of always am thinking about it is that the integrated database that we have, when you can like truly collaborate with a race director, because the race director has a different set of needs than you do. And our biggest problem, like when, when we, as timers start pulling data, out of whatever registration system we have, we're not necessarily collaborating with the race director anymore. We have to attend to our needs and the runner's needs at that point. And so many of you guys over the past several years have um, almost become, you know, you realize like, hey, an integrated database is better than a separate database for both of you um, and the runner, right? So if the runner comes to you and has a problem, you can make a change in the scoring platform and then it's reflected back in the registration platform. Therefore, when you make updates to results or emails are sent out, um, you're lowering that like kind of negative feedback. It's necessary negative feedback, like my time is wrong, my age is wrong, whatever it is, but that seems to be coming down. And, and, and the directors, to some extent, are starting to catch on to that because people are kind of asking like, hey, we want live results or I want like a complete database. Um, we still have a long ways to go. Like some people still aren't like getting it, but I think a lot of you guys are getting it, which is the most important thing to us because some people are just going to take a really long time to change and it is what it is. So this is the, the race day scoring team here. The uh, kind of addition here, see that guy? Oh, look at him. <laughs> I didn't change my shirt. <laughs> You're not supposed to admit that. You're supposed to say you have two shirts. I have two shirts. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, Chris was part of our, our, our sales team. And so I kind of pushed Chris because 
um, he was having more success in talking to you guys, um, not necessarily to like necessarily directly generate revenue, but to help you guys, you know, better utilize the tools. And so what we decided is that an additional investment in the race day team is having a resource who actually goes out and times races, who knows how to use the check-in system, has used a bunch of different hardware systems as well as, as well as scoring systems. Um, instead of like people like Matt Sinclair and I, who are like fake timers, like we kind of know what we're doing, but half the time we really don't. And we just tell you what we do now. Um, and so that kind of got like out of hand where we were like, yeah, just click on that, you know, click that button. Yeah. Um, and so crisp is now kind of, um, taken on a lot of the trainings. And as you guys know, like training sessions and timing aren't necessarily like 10 minutes. You know, if you're really going to deep dive on something, it takes an hour, hour and a half, you know, sometimes two hours, but those training sessions typically um, uh, generate dividends for both of you guys. Um, one for us, there's probably going to be less ongoing support on that particular training topic. And then two for you, you feel a lot more confident in actually um, talking to your directors about what we have to offer. Um, and I'll roll back to the check-in app. That seems to be like the point where once someone gets comfortable with that, they feel like, hey, I can roll that out to my customers. So Matt Avery is going to be digging into these things in more detail later. So the we have a bunch of kind of really interesting progress, like kind of marks on the uh, the roadmap. If you guys aren't, you may want to. Um, you can sign up for the race day scoring uh, blog, and you'll actually get updates. I that's how I get them now. Um, we do send that timer newsletter out now, um, so that may be more your preference. But if you want to be more real time on it, if you sign up for the blog when we put a release out. Um, it includes the release notes of like what's been updated um, and you know what bugs have been fixed. So if you, uh, there's some of you guys that are really good about like catching a bug and then submitting it back up to us and generally you're able to catch those very quickly. So um, to highlight probably your favorite thing on here is the adding direct to printer report option. <laughs> so there's some additional stuff that will come with that, but we, we did get that working. So we're there's some people that'll be very happy about that. Um, for some people that's actually been preventing them from, you know, Hey, I've got some fun run that I want to, you know, do the full thing with, but they weren't able to like print results and like put them out. So that was a problem year to date with race joy, which you've had a lot of success with this year by, and, and, and the way I see it is we're in a, this is a very much a transition year for us, but the transition starting to head in the direction we want. So there's a confluence of situations that are leading from us to be not the provider per se of race joy to you guys becoming the providers of race joy. Um, the number one thing, as we talked about a little bit yesterday is sales tax sales tax basically completely eliminates our ability to like generate incremental revenue off of race joy, because we'd have to like file and submit sales tax in every single state that you guys like set up like a processing fee add on for race joy. And we just don't want to do it. Like it's uh, reporting and like, it's just a nightmare. So um, in the past like month, I've had multiple timers who have won um, business, not exclusively, obviously your services um, are what they pay for and what they buy, but race joy has become kind of that sweetener to kick someone over um, their side. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to position that later, but basically, um, you know, for us, when a race comes to us and wants race joy, what we're doing now is saying like, we're not really offering it. I'm basically saying like, no, and if you want it, you have to work with a certified timer. So that will start, that will start to happen more and more is like, they'll say, well, my timer's not, they'll ask if they're certified or not. We can look up yes or no. If it's no, and they really want it, we have to then, you know, say, here's the list of timers that are our timer search that we came out with. You need to search for a timer in your area that's actually certified if you want that particular service. Cause like, we're basically not selling it anymore. You know, I've had people who say, well, I'll pay $3,000. I'm like, it's just not, I just don't want to do it, you know? Uh, because it's becoming too much of a pain for us. So um, in terms of like any strategy or overviews or things like that, is there any particular questions that you guys have about the team or like the direction that the product's heading? And I know a lot of you guys are kind of, you know, just playing right now, but if there's anybody that's like heavily using it, is there any particular questions or concerns? Aggregate teams. What's that? Aggregate teams. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the things that's preventing me from using it more. Yeah. So, um, we do have some team coding in specifically around relay teams. I think aggregate teams is going to be this fall. Like we, we can intentionally kick the can on cross country to not open that box for the season because we just knew we weren't going to be able to get it done in time. So like we could have got it done by like September, but what good is it getting done by September? Like if you need to test it in June and July before you would ever want, because depending on the season, cross country starts basically in August. 
you know, for early season. And it's just like, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't even want to put it out where you guys are having to like, oh yeah, I'm going to learn that in October. Great. Yeah. Skip that. Chris is going to join in now. This is where it's going to get a little bit more interactive. So we're going to kind of talk about like some strategies. So individually, I have these conversations with you guys about strategic planning for your business. Because again, like the way I kind of explain it is I see the forest and you guys have to deal with the tree or the leaf, you know? And so I can kind of help you guys pull back a little bit on, um, you know, what seems to be working. Yeah. Do you know where you're going to add in a uh, weight offset? Because that's really big for the trap one for you. That's what Chris, you know, I don't think that's Matt Avery's going to go over the fact. So this afternoon, Matt Avery is actually going to, that, that product overview, Matt Avery is going to drill into each one of those items and do a demo. Okay. So um, that would definitely, like, if you, you know, I would forget that question. <laughs> but, um, like, if you want to write that one down specifically, um, he, can, he can go over that with you. All right. Yep. All right. So, I think it's on. Yep. Um, so the, like, Brian said, we're going into thinking strategically. You guys already know who we are. So just kind of to follow up on what Brian said in regards to your scope of service um, as a timer. Um, I mean, I think all of you would agree that none of you fill in the, the, the underlying item of we are just the timer. Um, the moment you start saying not my job is the moment they start looking for someone else. Like the moment you're not the, the information or the... Uh, the expert in the field, because most of the races you work with, maybe not like the top 100 for some of you, or, or even the, the two or 3000 person race for some of you, but that's not the bulk of who you work with. Um, it might be, you might have a lot of those events, but um, you also have a lot of those three, four 500 person events that are kind of the bread and butter of your business. And um, they do it once a year and they don't know the best practice. And so you guys are the expert. We kind of went over this yesterday. So if you were in the closing session, just before Bob, the, there's more races, more competition and growing expectations for not just the athletes, but the spectators as well. And the race directors, if you can't tell already by what we're rolling out, there's constantly evolving technology. And if you're putting on 20 or 30 events a year, you probably don't have the bankroll to fund that. And that's kind of where run sign is trying to reinforce a lot of those by, by our investment in a lot of that technology trying to help you guys provide a better experience to your athletes and races. Like you said, this is, this is kind of a business strategy session. Your profits are being squeezed. So how do you, how do you fix that? Like, how do you stay profitable? So I kind of broke it down into three components for success in regards to pricing information integration. And from that, we basically said that, you know, you're going to either be um, cutting costs, Providing additional like add-ons or, or revenue for upselling something else that you do. Um, you're going to be the, the maven for information in the industry. The more information you can provide to your event, the more they're going to come to you with more questions, the less likely they're going to go to somewhere else. And then integration, the more fluidly all of your information flows back and forth, the more, it, the more streamlined your day is going to be, the more streamlined your event's going to go, the more happy your race director is going to be. Yeah, so to add some context to this, there's some best practices um, that I recommend that many people don't implement. Um, so, you know, obviously, um, I have uh, been doing sales since I was 16 years old. Um, I worked for my dad. I would cold call people when I was 16 years old. So if you wonder why I'm comfortable on the phone, it's because that was literally what I had to do in order to um, not get kicked out of my house. So dad's like, well, you can either call people or set appointments for me or you know, you can go get another job. So I cold called people. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of strategies that come into that. Um, the number one thing that, that timers um, do that drives me up the wall is they complain about their competition. Uh, I'm like, yeah, your competition is not here to help you. Um, believe it or not, they're here to make you better. Um, and that's the way you should think about your competition is like, you can complain about them in your head. Um, you can complain about them to your, your spouse or to your friends. Um, but in your head, you should say, well, they're just keeping you honest, right? Like if you didn't have competition, you probably charge more. If you didn't have competition, you probably wouldn't reinvest in your business. Um, and so that's kind of the way that I look at it. Um, I promise you, we have far more competitors, um, that are more aggressive than you guys do. Um, and, uh, I don't really worry about them. Like not in like, I don't think they exist. It's just that if they take a customer cause they do a better job than we do, like, well, that's not my fault, you know? Um, the other things that I typically see is, um, I don't have a lot of people that ask me about, um, contact management. So, um, 
in our business, um, we, we talk about our CRM, you know, for your participants, we have a separate CRM for you guys. And that's how we stay organized as a team. So that's how I know when to call you. Um, that's how I know um, that Chris has interacted with you and done a training session because the emails are syncing in. Um, I'm not saying you need to go to that level per se, but you should have a system in place in order to organize your contacts and who your race directors are, when they would be interested in being contacted about like next year's race, because the other thing people don't really ask me about, they just assume it, which just blows my mind, um, is renewals. Like renewals are incredible, right? Like there's far less work in a customer that comes back than a new customer, right? So we all want to make more money and work less. So renewals are king. Um, if you notice in our system, we send these really annoying emails that say you should renew your race. We have people that reply to them and say, thanks, Brian. I was thinking about renewing my race next week. I'm like, well, hell, I don't even know where that email came from. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I didn't send it. They think we personally sent the email, right? <laughs> so, so like building systems around renewals and when to contact people isn't necessarily work that you have to do. It's systems that you have to put in place in order to run your business more efficiently. And so part of that is building a contact list of who your directors are. Also having a list of people who don't work with that you want to work with and assigning yourself tasks that can't be kicked down the road of like when you want to you know, reach out to them. So if you talk to a director and they say, we don't make buying decisions in January, we make buying decisions in February. Okay, fine. I'll contact you in February. And I guarantee you, if you contact them in February, they say, we don't make buying decisions in February. We make buying decisions in March. So the point is, is that once you get in a rhythm with someone and you contact them a few times, they will then start, you know, build, you'll start building a relationship with them. And believe it or not, it is not illegal to contact another timer's customers. Um, I, I've heard that a bunch of times and I laugh because I'm like, it, it's not unfair. Now, if you have a working relationship with someone, there's, that's one thing. I mean, if you guys work together, um, but you also have to understand, like, that is actually the definition of collusion. If you say, hey, Steve, I'm going to charge three bucks. Chris, you're going to charge three bucks. And Matt says he's going to charge three bucks. That is collusion. You can actually get in trouble for that. Now, luckily, the state has far better things to do than get you in trouble for that. But that is the definition of it. Um, so you have to be like kind of thinking about these types of things. Um, the, and there's some lessons you can learn from Run Sign Up and some of the things that we do well. It's just really hard for you guys to do some of the things, which is you know, getting to the point that Chris had is content. like. Um, so Raul and I are on LinkedIn. Raul has a continual small stream of information on LinkedIn about what he did last weekend. So if you're not posting like a picture, you know, if you prefer Instagram and your directors seem to be more on Instagram, just taking a picture with your phone and putting it on there. And like, you guys get some fantastic pictures. Like, you know, you're up at dawn, you see dew on the grass, take a picture, done, right? And put up the link to the results afterwards, like that type of content with directors, like when you, the next time you contact them, you might have a little bit better chance. So like, these are the little things that you can do because the reason I'm bringing all these things up is that there's simple economic forces that are working against you, um, which is four years ago, there was 50,000 races that we knew about this year. We see 47,000. That means there's less races and the same or more timers. Um, so it's going to be harder for you right now to grow your business. Um, if you're not doing these little things to make sure that your business is organized in the best way possible. And if you have questions like stuff like about that, like this is my expertise, like this is what I do for a living is organizing um, sales and marketing teams to try to, um, you know, put ourselves in the best light. We are not good salespeople. We get told that all the time. And I'm like, okay, fine. Right? Like I've told, I've been told many times that race roster is better at selling than, than we are. And I'm like, great. Like, but ultimately being a great salesperson, isn't going to overcome the mountain of technology of, at, at that point. And you guys are the similar thing. Like you can be the greatest salesperson in the world. But I promise you, if you don't put results up, they won't hire you back. <laughs> um, so again, we went over the suite of tools here. So I, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about pricing because this is, this has started to change in the past, like literally in the past month, something happened three times that had never happened before. So this is again, going back to the economic forces of a declining market, which is, I had a 5,000 person turkey trot um, that uh, moved forward to run sign up in February. Now, guess what? They didn't set up their race till June 20th. Um, no big deal, right? It's not till Thanksgiving. 
But in the time that from they went and signed up, which they were super happy about, now they're even happier because of like the Facebook fundraising stuff, and they want to do some fundraising because it's for um, it's for a uh, like a Greenway type thing. And so in that time in between, three timers because they put their contract out for timing bid on their raise. Yeah, great, right? Three timers seems logical. In that time, all three of those timers use Run Sign Up. All three of them are currently partners. All three of them gave them different pricing proposals. And two of them offered the commission back to the race and one didn't. So that's the type of stuff that's gonna to start to happen is that in a declining market, right? You say, hey, I have an advantage that I can take to myself. I have an advantage I could pass to my race. And this is a decent sized race, right? And so what I wanna educate you guys on is that just because you have this income stream that comes from run sign up, which we are perfectly happy to give to you and we think that you deserve it. As the races get bigger, there's a pinch, right? You guys want the money, the race wants the money, and somehow you guys want run sign up to take out of our pocket. I can't do that. Like I have to draw a line somewhere. Um, everybody in our industry basically charges more than us. I can't pay you guys and them. So there has to be an open and transparent discussion about how that works. So you can explain to them like, hey, if you take this, I'm not here to answer your questions about race setup. You need to take more of an ownership um, mentality of your registration page. If you want to email me 85 times about how to set up a coupon code, I'm going to get paid for that. And once that happens and people can make that decision of like, oh, I don't really want to do that. Um, we've you've eliminated that competitor that is going to call them up and say, I'll give that to you because they already understand that they already have in their head. Like, I don't want to do that work. I want to pay Matthew to do that work or Corey or whoever on his team. They understand that. And so this is going to happen more and more and more because as we pick up more market share and we get more partners and those races that get to that, that's kind of weird, awkward size where they're like kind of big enough to be a partner on their own because they could qualify for a discount, but they really shouldn't get it because they're not like capable of like really being what we want from a partner, which is, you know, mostly self-serve, but you guys can work with like kind of our higher level support when like true issues come in. That's what we're looking for from a partner, right? They t they're kind of in between there. And so you guys need to be thinking about how can you position this because it's going to like, you're going to get burned at some point. And it, since we have a group of people that understand this, I want you to know, like, I think this is going to be worse six months from now. So is there any questions or thoughts on that? Yeah. Is it uh, something that you maybe consider to, to, to do training for race directors on how to set up their own registrations, like teach them how to use run sign up, like run sign up certified? Um, we've had a couple of people ask us about that. Oh yeah, sorry. So we had a, um, the question was about, have we thought about like uh, a run sign up certification? Um, I had somebody ask me about it independently of what you said yesterday. Um, we haven't really thought about it, but I'm, I mean, we could definitely do it. Um, I just don't know um, exactly what that would look like now. Um, and it, cause it would have to be it, more than likely we could do a little bit like in person, but it also have to be, you know, of course online and I'm not sure like what value that race gets out of it, you know? Um, so I, I, it's something we'll think about, you know, I just don't have a clear answer on that. So and on the flip side of that, um, we're also rolling out, we'll talk about it briefly in a bit, um, or we can talk about it now. It doesn't really matter, but, um, we're building out material so you can provide that service to your races. Um, and you can still be the partner, but you can provide like a race day or race, uh, uh, race director, uh, expo or small conference that's quite literally going through how to use tools and things like that. And to some degree, you'll be able to press play on a PowerPoint slide. Um, I would suggest you talk if you do that, just to remind them that you know how it works as well. Um, but we're actually, the, the only rules on our end in that support is that you use run sign up for the registration side. You don't have to charge for it. Um, use the check-in app when people come and then um, we'll actually reimburse you $15 uh, per head um, on that. And I mean, we're, it's honor system. We, again, you guys are our partners. We're expecting like honesty both directions. And so um, we don't need to see receipts or anything like that. We're not looking, we're hoping you guys aren't looking this, uh, this is a revenue stream because you should be providing like lunch or a snack or something like that. Um, but I mean, realistically, it's just another way for you to, like Brian said, like set yourself apart from those other 
Tires. Yeah, and, and that's that's going to be a big thing for whenever your off season is, is that um, if you're looking to grow your business, um, you know, these timer training sessions, or I'm sorry, the race director training sessions that are run by our partners. Um, I've been a part of several of these um, as we were kind of developing it. And generally speaking, the feedback has been like what you guys give us for the symposium. It's like, hey, I'm so gl- grateful to have a resource and the opportunity to learn and also network with other people. Um, that's generally the kind of the feedback we get is like, there's not very many opportunities in this niche space to be able to do those types of things. And so you become kind of a beacon in the community of information and networking and, um, you know, kind of trying to support the, the, the market. So, um, your goal in those meetings is like, get as many prospects as you can, but make sure you got customers that say nice things about you in there too. Um, that's what we do. So, you know, like, you know, I could like kind of point out in the room, which like, which one of you guys are getting paid by us right now to say nice things and which ones like aren't. So like. You know, you, you guys do the same strategy and we'll be good. So the other one, uh, and this one's relatively new, we talked about this a little bit at um, some of the sessions, is the timer pricing. So timer pricing kind of flows into a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about is transparency. If you want to increase the processing fees, one of the easiest ways to increase the processing fees and turn it into a non-starter discussion is, um, you know, say, hey, I want to add, you know, 50 cents a person or 75 cents a person. You might include that in your timing contract. So that you know you've already um, eliminated that um, kind of like argument because like hey it's gonna be added onto the processing fee, and then what you do is you itemize the services that are included in that like the check-in app or RaceJoy and other things that you want to include within our service suite and potentially within your own um, that you use that and then what you do is give the race director either a credit in cash like twenty five cents if it's seventy five cents or something like that you immediately eliminate, you're like, oh, well, you're getting a credit immediately, and then you're getting all these extra benefited services and your other provider charged X. So therefore it's price equivalent or it's a little bit cheaper and you're giving them a small benefit back. Um, I don't like doing that per se, but it, it, it's all about like how much time do we wanna waste negotiating, right? If it's a small amount um, to get the rest of it, but you've done it in a transparent manner, Again, you got to realize like there's other people in your market and if they're coming at it with a different strategy than you have, um, if you have someone else that's using another platform or with a different pricing structure, but they're not being transparent, uh, you will, there's, there's tons of companies now that are, that are not being transparent in their markets. You will come off as a better um, provider and they will feel um, a little closer to you and more aligned. Um, and if they get a bid from someone else, at that point, hopefully they share with you, you know, hey, this is what it's attractive to me about that bid. And you get the opportunity to say, well, you know, uh, this is this bid is not exactly what you think. And if you guys run into situations like that where you're, you're really struggling to understand why a race director is interested in a um, like a particular package, give me a call. I'll walk you through it because um, most of the time I know the games and gimmicks that people are playing. It, it all comes down to dollars paid. Right. Like if you don't understand that you're going to pay more money, like someone needs to tell you, like, and I'll tell you, right. It's like, no, actually you're going to pay $4,000 more. So congratulations. You just signed a more expensive contract. There's a lot of different ways that you can increase revenue using run sign up. These are just some of like some, some general ideas. So I, the ways that I generally recommend increasing revenue through run sign up is more of like a package set of, of tools. Um, so like in general, like, I feel like a lot of you guys are, are mixed now where you own some races or are providing race management. Can I get a raise of hands? Like who people that own or, or manage races for others. So it's like, I thought it's, it's most of the people. Um, so where, where run sign up can help you with, um, generating more revenue, especially if you're owning races or managing them for others is a lot of what we talked about yesterday. And if you weren't here yesterday, it, it was around a lot of our automated marketing tools. Um, and, and if you're doing that on behalf of someone else, you need to make sure you, you kind of like that is a line item that should be included in a, in a timing proposal. Like, oh, well, if you sign on with us, we're going to send out emails about your price increases. We're going to send out incomplete registration emails. Um, we're going to um, set up the best practices for referrals, which generates, you know, blank percent plus blank percent and increased registrations. Those are value adds that most of the time. Um, I understand in timing, you, you guys are very specific about you want to provide accurate results. Um, you want to provide uh, the, you know, the fastest results, text messaging, you know, all these bells and whistles. The race directors, like you look at our sessions, like I wish I could like show you a chart of like how many people show up to the sessions. 
they show up to the marketing sessions like an astronomically higher rate than like our payment account sessions. Um, we make a joke to our finance person that like the only people that showed up to a session last year that were employees of front sign up. <laughs> so make sure that you guys are paying attention to that. Um, when we talk about on-site registration, this one's a little bit of a sticky situation now because um, the sign up app is something that some of you guys like and that's great. Some of you guys might use kiosks, blah, blah, blah. We are pushing more and more of you guys towards mobile registration. So I'll kind of give you the, the pitch on mobile. And if you want to ask someone, Eric Arndt, great person to ask. He's in the middle of the room in the white shirt. Um, definitely talk to him because he actually is the boldest person in the room. He makes everybody sign up on their phone on race day and provides no options to sign up on race day otherwise. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, like really, really putting the gauntlet down saying I'm not reading your damn handwriting. Um, so um, I, most of the, I've, I've told Eric, like I've told other people, Eric, about this and they just like, like I can hear their eyes like roll and like, and groan. Like, and I'm like, well, you know, some people are lucky and some people aren't. Um, so when you're talking about uh, the mobile registration, the most important thing to know is that um, it's highly customizable and you need to start like kind of advertising that registration is not closing and that it's super easy to register and like cut, you can cut back the registration to the point where it's like no different than a, in a registration form. Now the ancillary benefits of this stuff are so high that people don't realize. So like if you're a director of a race and you think back however many years before you maybe changed into like more of like having putting all your data into run sign up. Like how much data have you lost over the years of people that you could have marketed another race to or that race again next year, you know, like say, Hey, like you're an on-site registrant, you're in my database. Now I can tell you about these other races that I have or, or, you know, would you sign up again this year? That value of that data, along with the in information, in our CRM, you can start kind of seeing trends. And, and, and be a more intelligent marketer, but if the data never makes it into the platform, there's absolutely nothing you or the director could possibly do. So I talked about this a little bit earlier, and again, sales tax kind of really, it just kind of killed it for us as like, you guys are our distributors. So just to be very clear now, if a race comes to us, the first thing we're gonna do is see if we can get them to partner with one of you. Um, if, they're, if you're the existing timer, it's extremely easy then, because we can then say, hey, Raul is your, um, your timer. He's a certified timer. Therefore, um, he, you can have a uh, discussion with him about your policy on race joy. So we do not quote pricing and we do not quote your policy on it. To give you some context, um, I think you can charge for race joy. Um, many times people will bundle that. And like when we were talking about timer fees, like the 50 cents or 75 cent add-on, that is typically bundled into that as a line item of, of, of bundled packages. How you want to approach that, that's completely up to you. Um, and the one thing that we did get clarification on, and I really hope to God this doesn't change, is that timer fees are not taxable. So it's considered a service right now. So there shouldn't be any impact on you guys on that for the, at least for this week. You know, we'll see what happens <laughs> next week. But we, we, we really pushed on that one. That's actually why we pulled it out because software itself, if we sell an app, is taxable. So that was what killed it for us. Um, so in terms of information, we've actually talked about several of these. You guys know and appreciate, I've gotten a lot of great feedback that you guys really appreciate us trying to understand the sales tax as best we can. We're gonna put a bunch of blogs out. So one of the ways that you can be a resource for your race directors is you know, take the blog that you think is the most kind of overarching and maybe the least detail oriented, share that with your directors, right? Be the resource in your community of saying like, look, in Wisconsin, Here's your responsibility for sales tax. Um, here's a supporting blog through a provider. You know, please know that you know, race day events is on top of this or blah, 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 timing company is on top of this. And we want you to understand we are helping you get in compliance with this. If you have questions, of course, reach out to the team. That's super important. Um, one of the other ones that I haven't talked about and I've had some success with, with others is buying a domain um, specific to your community and setting up a race calendar. So one of the things that we can help you do is we have a little widget that you can plug onto the site that just is like a rolling um, stream of races. That's like a, you know, you put in like a radius of a zip code, right? And you can, and, and the weird ones too, are like, hey, um, like this area. So if you're in Philly, you also have races in New Jersey, you might have races in Delaware, and you might have races in Maryland because it's a, you know, kind of a real tight area. So when you build those out, we can actually exclude or include certain states as well. So um, that's something you can do. And the cool thing about that is you can actually highlight or feature the races that you work with. That's an option when you build the widget. 
Um, and so what you're trying to do then is you can also then offer an option for people to like sign up for your newsletter and things like that. But the thing is, is like, <clears throat> you can, of course, highlight your services, right? Looking for race management, looking for race marketing, like just put marketing all over the thing, right? Like, hey, we offer marketing services and people are going to click on it and request information. So it becomes a lead source um, tool for you uh, because people are coming to that site over time. Like it'll, it's a very slow churn unless you guys really push on it to start building traffic up on it because it has to exist for some period of time and be something that people um, see as a resource. One of the interesting um, reports um, that we have is the check-in app report. I'm not sure if anybody's like dug into this. I have um, had like a couple times where we've actually really needed it. So if you set up the check-in app correctly, you can kind of get a report of like how many people checked in and at what station. And what's really interesting, so we work with um, the Thundercloud Turkey Trot and it's crazy how many people, you know, like they have these like peaking demands of people and that's, they've been using that information to try to help them figure out staffing because it's like a, it's a large race, uh, 20,000 ish, 18,000 ish people, um, that they do dynamic bid assignment for. But the idea is that it's put on by a sub store. So they want people coming through the store. Right. Um, and, and so they want to staff it like as tight as they can, because if I've never been in the store, I'm guessing it's not that big. It's probably, yeah. Yeah. So. These are the types of things that um, when you need them, they become huge assets. And like when you don't need them, if you just go into check-in reports, you can see some graphs on like what's going on at your races. Giveaway reports, I would say most of the people in this room are pretty familiar with that because most of you guys either are apparel providers or have you know very close relationships with apparel providers because t-shirts are such a pain. Um, so you understand probably how to use that. Um, the referral reports, um, this is something that Ideally, in, like in the ideal world, what I would love for race directors to be able to do is get a report either from Run Sign Up and or their partner that was like, hey, here's your t-shirt report, here's your registration report, here's like your marketing report. Like, you know, if we imagine we were all like CEOs of giant companies and we didn't have to like actually answer emails and people just brought us reports that said like neat stuff, um, that would be like in an ideal world. Um, I think for large customers, um, you know, and you guys get to define what your large customers are. I think it is important to take a little bit of time and maybe just grab a couple of screenshots or download the reports as well. And like when you send that follow up email asking them for any feedback of like what went well or what didn't go well, including those reports is just like that little drip of marketing that you're doing for your company next year. And you might be able to also ask for the commitment for next year, you know, saying, hey, what's your date for 2020 or what's your date for 2021? So using these reports as little sales tools, marketing tools is a good idea. And not even on the sales, like not even on the after side, like it gives you something to communicate with them about periodically. So like you start talking about your referral ROI, like it, it reminds them that you've set something up for them and it is actively making them money or is actively saving them money or is active. Like you've got these numbers at your disposal and most race directors do not know how to go in and run those reports. Whereas once you guys, if you don't already know how to talk to an AM and, um, I mean, it's super simple to do. So we talked about a bunch of these items on the integrations piece. The bib assignment tool is probably one that most commonly we get, you know, of course, either panicked or confused questions on. So the, the, um, the bib assignment tool is pretty powerful. One of the things that you can like that you can do is, um, you can mix and match. So what I mean is, is like sometimes the, the, the CEO of a company or your lead sponsor wants bib number one or whatever. Um, and you can, you know, kind of plug that person in with a bib number and then do other types of assignments. And as long as you don't click overwrite the bib numbers, I, I wanted to point that out. I get that question a lot is like, you have a small subset of people that are just weird, you know, they have something going on. So a lot of times that, that what ends up happening is that the person pulls the whole data, does all this manipulation, right? And then doesn't use our tool because it doesn't meet that 10 people. I'm like, no, I would just assign the 10 people and then let the tool go to work and do what I wanted it to do. So that's just something important to know. You know, in terms of some of the tools that we have, I think a lot of you guys have, you know, used most of these. The only one that I think some people in the room may still be struggling with, but not everybody is the video. So how many of you guys are struggling with that or have questions about that? Got one, two. Okay. So maybe um, join up with us afterwards and also talk to, talk to some of the people in the room too. Um, Cause video is kind of interesting. It is, it is harder to explain than it is to do. And like, cause once you do it, I've had people be like, that's stupid easy. 
And I'm like, yeah, I just can't explain it to you. Sorry. <laughs> you know, um, I'm like, the hardest part is getting your video up on YouTube. Yep. Um, it just takes time. To so like, like, like literally record, remembering to hit record, first hardest thing. Um, the second hardest thing is, you know, taking that video out of the camera and then getting it into the computer. And then once you get it on YouTube, like anybody in the whole world that knows how to count can do it. And it does not have to be a chip timed event, but there's the other pieces that are along that chain forgot to hit record, or I have a, uh, a camera type that doesn't want to work with my computer, way bigger problems. <laughs> so uh, that one that one has bit me and others before. Um, I've had a lot, I, and you guys should probably talk among yourselves about what cameras that you like. I mean, people ask us and I'm like, well, GoPro is the simplest, I think. Um, but Kodak um, has one, Garmin has one. Um, so I'm sure you could probably buy some knockoff one as well. It, it all comes to me. It's all about the software that it comes with. Um, and the other thing to let you guys know, if you don't know this, YouTube has a pretty decent, um, video editing tool. And so, um, you can make like, okay videos, um, not like great videos, but you're just snipping them. That's super easy to do. Um, but if you're making like a little video for like your race that you own, you can actually um, do a light amount of editing in YouTube. I would not call it fantastic, but um, it's okay. And it's going to take you a while to upload. Don't sit there on your MiFi thinking you're going to push this. Yeah, up that is not a good idea. It is not. Wait until tomorrow. Yeah, the, 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 what I recommend is um, if you can, um, and this is like really old school, is um, make sure you um, plug your computer into your router. So don't run it over Wi-Fi, actually plug the computer in and that will like, that will take it from like a four hour process to like 30 or 40 minutes. And if you don't know, um, do speedtest.net on your, on your um, network connection at home. Make sure, cause like you may be supposed to be getting 50 or 75 megabytes. That's fairly common in the U S now is between 50 and hundred. Like make sure you test that with it plugged in. Um, so that you know whether you're getting that connection. Cause some people have told me they it's like six hours to upload a video. I'm like, I uploaded a video in like 10 minutes, you know? So it, it's most of the time the connection, um, of your computer. So the only thing that I wanted to really point out that we haven't talked about is you guys have a really cool option for virtual races now. So virtual races, like timers kind of don't like them obviously, cause they're not necessarily revenue, but like if you own races, they're actually really cool opportunities for you um, cause you can add options in and it's a way to get what I remind people. And especially like, like, so, you know, you guys can kind of tell, like I at least look like a runner. Um, you know, I was fairly competitive. Like I'm not like the best runner. Like Jordan ran like 359 for the mile. I ran 415. So he kicked the crap out of me. Um, but you know, I was competitive. And so like, as I've gotten older and you know, like I can't really run fast anymore. Um, like, you know, I'm not really that competitive anymore. Unless you challenge me to ping pong, I'll beat you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but virtual races, the way you need to look at them is your feeder system. So like, this is like youth football or youth cheerleading. Like this is a, um, what we found. And, and if you got a chance to talk to the sourfish people, um, they're super interesting is that the information that you get from virtual races is that you can read the data and, and make inferences. These are typically a lot more female participants. So make sure that your sizing of shirts, your medals, your marketing is more female oriented. It was like 90 something percent were females. Um, they're also um, people who likely have not done a race before. So if you're thinking about this and, and in triathlons, they think about this a lot because the numbers in triathlons are struggling right now. Like if your relay numbers are good, likely in the future, your race will still be healthy. If your relay numbers suck, I can guarantee you, you know, your numbers are going to start going down. So it's the same thing with like, if you have virtual races or your races are putting on virtual races and they're doing well, that is a good indicator that you should be able to then with the correct marketing message, which would be very different to a virtual race participant that I want to convert into a local um, race participant. They want, they think that they're not good enough to do your race. That is the thing that you guys need to realize and your marketing needs to reflect that. So what we've built into the virtual race system, and I'm not sure how much, like if I was someone that was afraid of doing a race that I'd want to engage in it, is you can sign up to get a text or email to, after the virtual race kind of concludes and you could submit your result. We have light amounts of validation. Like you can say, hey, we don't want to take times less than 15 minutes for a 5K and more than two hours for a 5K. So it can do a little bit. So someone can't put in a time of one second, you know, um, and then it automatically pre-populates a results page as soon as they submit it. But the most important thing for you guys to realize is like, don't poo poo 
virtual races. They sound like they're hurting your business. They're actually quite opposite um, because these are assets to your database then. So um, and make sure in your head you're positioning that to races that come to do that with you because I think that will be good for you in the long term. And the finisher certificate side of that is actually a pretty powerful thing because like Matt Every said at the end of yesterday, um, in regards to every race that you put on, someone at that race is their first race and it's a really, really big deal to them. So it's very important every race. This, for those virtual events, is a lot of times, like Brian said, they're gateway in. So if you make them feel special and they have, I mean, a lot of these people that you might not realize, they're printing out result certificates, like finisher certificates. They matter to people. The finisher medals matter to people. So um, it's one really easy way to engage those folks. So um, I'm going to wrap this up and then we're going to do the timer panel, which is going to be kind of a, a way for us to kind of uh, dig in a little bit more. How many of you guys got the pitch yesterday on, on Give Sign Up? like most of the room. Um, so the most important thing for you guys to know about Give Sign Up. Um, so I know that, that you know, uh, I've talked about like, you know, challenging marketing market conditions and things like that. And that's just being honest, right? Um, but um, Give Sign Up is the opportunity for you to grow your business. Um, it may not make sense for you. Uh, I'm, if it doesn't make sense for you, that's okay. Like we totally get that. Um, the most important thing for you to know is that our partner program extends to Give Sign Up. Um, so you have the opportunity to go into your community or the race directors that you work with, which are likely nonprofits because it's 90% nonprofits that we work with. It's probably about the same for you. Um, and you can talk to them about events and talk to them about, you know, hey, could I you know, help you? Because the other thing that's a really huge selling asset is that um, we built the race websites where you can map the domain. You can do the same thing with a ticket event now. So they can have their own little website because a lot of them don't have a website. They just have a page within their um, existing nonprofit page. So this is a huge opportunity for you guys to build, like the way we look at it is like, we're adding another uh, like piece to our stool so that we can, you know, kind of build our business out to be more stable. We're also going to be able to solve the biggest like flaw in our system that I see, which is like a more deep reporting and CRM system. So there's going to be a lot of benefits that come from you guys. And I, at a very high level, the way that I see it is you go talk to people, see what kind of feedback you get. And the way you want to pitch this is like as an event management company, you own computers, tablets, tents, chairs, tables, all sorts of different equipment. If you're putting on an event of almost any kind, you need that kind of equipment. So you can engage with them about like what kind of equipment or staff they might need. You may not want to do that, but like think of it that way. Because again, if let's say Mike Melton and I are going to bid on each other down to the point where it's a dollar fifty a runner in time a race, whereas Chris could call up a nonprofit. Um, and I've had conversations with people that have multi-thousand person ticket events. They'll move just because they like Crisp and like what they were doing with him. So now Mike and I have beat each other up down to $1.40. We don't have any fun. We don't make any money. Chris gets $3,000 and goes home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we do think we're going to make some minor changes to the, to the partner program in that um, we will have like a certification for Give Sign Up. Um, and that is to your benefit as well, because right now you guys are going to be bringing the leads. Um, very soon, I'm going to be giving you the leads. Um, because what's going to happen is, is that as we get more out there and people get aware of us, they're going to ask for a demo. They're going to ask for a face-to-face -face meeting. You guys are going to be the people that run our face-to-face -face meetings. We do not have intentions of opening offices in Houston and Phoenix and Los Angeles to please all those, every single city that has a nonprofit. I have not met a nonprofit yet that hasn't asked for a face-to-face -face meeting. We don't have the ability to do that. You guys will be our distributors. You'll be certified. Um, and then you guys will be able to offer those services to them. So that's like super high level pitch on that. So, all right. I guess the next thing we need to do is we're going to set up for the the timer panel. The timer panel, yep.